J'ai le plaisir donc d'accueillir, nous avons le plaisir d'accueillir pour cette quatrième et dernière table ronde uh, The Country President for the Andean Zone at Schneider Electric, chez Schneider Electric, donc Marcos Mathias, merci d'être avec nous. Uh, également Patricia Kraus qui est économiste pour la région Amérique latine à COFAS. Carlos Kenan, vous êtes économiste, vice-président de l'Institut des Amériques. And finally, enfin, José Antonio, José Antonio uh, Gomez Bazan, vous êtes uh, PDG, Chief uh, Executive Officer chez Camposol Trading. Merci d'être avec nous. Um, Peut-être une uh, première question tout de suite pour uh, Patricia, uh, qui a d'ailleurs uh, des, uh, des, des slides prévus pour cette, uh, pour cette partie, uh, sur la manière, how do you see, uh, where do you see uh, the uh, economy going for the whole region in the coming months, for the whole Latin America Well, uh, to understand where we are going, you know, where the Latin American go, uh, region is going, uh, it's important to remember how it got there. So in the last decade and a half, we have seen a strong improvement in terms of GDP growth rate in the region, uh, mainly thanks to the rapid growth in China and its higher demand for commodity. Latin American region is really rich in agro, mineral, Oh, and for energy street, commodities. Okay, and uh, and was really benefited by that timing. So <laughs> now we see, uh, as we know, Chinese economy has been decelerating, and so did uh, Latin American economies. Yes, we do not expect any rebounds so far. So uh, I think that these charts help us to identify because, of course, they are not all economies impacted the same way. Uh, here we consider the major economies of Latin America uh, in terms of GDP. Yes, so the first chart shows the ratio of exports to GDP, and the second one, the representativeness of exports uh, of commodities to export that country. So uh, we see that Mexico is the most open economy at the region, uh, exports there It represent 31% of GDP, but at the same time, they are not, they, yes, they hold energy uh, commodity, oil, uh, but it more, more concentrated, concentrated in manufacturing for the US market. So they gain a lot of competitiveness during, uh, with the NAFTA agreement in 1994. Uh, it's not that concentrated in commodities. Uh, then we have Chile with 29%. Chile is a different case. They are really concentrated in commodities, mainly mineral, as an important uh, player uh, of copper. Yeah, so they were impacted by the lower prices. And finally, we have Ecuador. Ecuador really associated with oil prices, uh, followed by Peru uh, with minerals, copper, silver, uh, gold, and so on. Colombia, it's lower representativeness of exports to GDP, but still also very associated with energy, with oil prices. And finally, Argentina and Brazil. Both economies are still very close to ones. Uh, we say that Brazil is a big uh, player in all the three kinds, with agro, energy, uh, and mineral, uh, but still very close, only, represent only 10% of the economy. And for Argentina, 13% and really associated with agro commodities, mainly uh, wheat and soya. Yes. So. Okay, so with this strong deterioration in terms of trade, of course, the uh, currency was also very impacted. So here we consider the five main currency for free-floating exchange rate. That's why you don't have Argentina now, because until one month ago, the exchange, there, exchange rate there was fixed. And Ecuador, as they have a dollarized economy. So we consider these five ones. We see that the Brazilian hell was the one which observed the strongest depreciations in the last one year and a half. Uh, as I showed before, it's still a very close economy. So uh, when we see that it has depreciated in a high intensity, this is associated with the, the current scenario of the Brazilian economy, this confident shock this recession, uh, this impeachment risk, and uh, the corruption scandal involving the oil giant uh, state-owned Petrobras. So this has really impacted on exchange rate, on the Brazilian exchange rate. Then it's followed by Colombia. Colombia also associated, associated with oil prices, and also uh, has observed a strong deterioration in the current account, yeah, with this uh, negative in terms of trade. 
And uh, we see that uh, Peru and Chile were less impacted because also because prices were going down of minerals, that negative for them, but they, have, they were partly offset by lower energy prices as they are net importers. Okay. Uh, so here we have uh, the performance of the manufacturing industry. Why? Because when we have a strong deterioration in exchange rate, we usually we uh, we could expect any, any uh, some improvement in the manufacturing industry as they get more competitive. Uh, but here, what we see uh, is that up to now we don't see big improvements in the manufacturing of these countries. Up to now, uh, take into account the Brazilian case, we see that the industry keep uh, decreasing. Uh, if we take into account the, the performance until the in the last until November last year, it has been decreased by 12, 21 months in a row. And we don't see that now it's decreasing at a lower rhythm. No, it's decreasing at a higher rhythm. The last decrease uh, was 12% compared to the same months of the previous year. Uh, that was after an 11% and 10%. So it really continues to go down. So why we see this? Uh, people were with hopes that that the industry would rebound, that the the fault of the the sensitive industry is because of the exchange rate issue. And now that we have seen the exchange rate depreciating, don't see improvement. Uh, it's true that usually a gap between a strong depreciation and movement and uh, improvement. But still, there's already a long time. We should have had observed any improvement. Secondly, because when you have strong movement in exchange <coughs> rate, this negative even for exporters because it's difficult to, to make forecasts because they think that it could change easily too. Or they, can, they take time to recover old clients or to, to get new ones. But actually, the main point for Latin America is because they hold strong <coughs> bottlenecks of infrastructure. So I think that's the, the, the biggest point now is that they need to improve infrastructure in the region. Uh, this is an old issue that they didn't take advantage of the bonanza period of the commodities. And they, it's difficult to do it now because the government is also with lower revenues, with tight fiscal uh, revenues because of the, the lower prices. So the main deal now is to attract investments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Patricia. Uh, Carlos Kenan, il faut s'habituer à une croissance durablement plus faible en, en Amérique latine? Disons que oui. Et en tout cas, on est dans une phase de ralentissement qui va sans doute se prolonger clairement, même dans un contexte plutôt récessif en 2016. Et la croissance latino-américaine est très fortement corrélée, si on regarde sur le long terme, avec l'évolution des termes de l'échange. Et, et si l'on croit à certaines, certains travaux qui ont décelé une certaine régularité depuis, depuis deux siècles dans l'évolution des, des cycles de hausse et des de baisses des de, de matières premières, euh, je pense à Carmen Reinhardt par exemple, et, et des, des, des cycles de hausse de 7-8 ans et, et des cycles de baisse à peu près de cette même euh, portée, peut-être avec l'exception de l'après. La, de eh, 1935, disons, où il y a eu la Deuxième Guerre mondiale et un cycle, disons, de, de forte croissance des prix des matières premières liés à la, à la reconstruction européenne. Eh bien, là, on est dans une phase où, à partir de 2011-2012, les cycles des matières premières s'est inversé et ça risque de durer jusqu'en 2018. Et, et du coup, l'Amérique latine est, je crois, au milieu d'une décennie, une demi-décennie perdue, avec euh, déjà en 2015 une et situation, disons, de recul du PIB par habitant, puisqu'il y a eu une récession. Bien évidemment, euh, après, il y a une diversité de situations sous-régionales et nationales. Et vous avez euh, effectivement les profils d'exportation différents. Le Mexique est moins dépendant des matières premières. Et je dirais que plus généralement, le Mexique et les petits pays de l'Amérique centrale euh, sont plutôt moins dépendants des matières premières, même pour la plupart d'entre eux, des importateurs nets de matières premières. Donc, ils bénéficient un peu de cette situation. Mais ça ne pèse pas lourdement dans l'ensemble du PIB régional, mm -hmm. alors que les grandes économies de l'Amérique du Sud, elles, sont véritablement très, très touchées. Et bien évidemment, euh, parmi ces économies-là, euh, le Brésil et le Venezuela, où et les problèmes dont je viens de parler, l'évolution de l'échange, vont de pair avec des déséquilibres internes très, très importants. 
Uh, Jose Antonio, when we prepared for this panel, you first told me, uh, oh, I mean, when we focused on the Andean region, uh, you first told me uh, the big question is whether the middle class matures enough to survive now that we are going downwards. But if the economy is too dependent on commodities, it will not sustain. That's your opinion. Well, first of all, uh, we need to be clear that Latin America in the last two centuries has been going through different commodities booms or, and then economic expansion after, after those booms. Most of those expansions were basically related to commodities and the only thing that they have left on Latin America is limited amount of infrastructure that was built directly related to the commodity itself. Mm -hmm talking about railroads, ports, highways, etc. In this last economic boom that happened in the last 10 years, we have seen something a little bit different. Uh, typically, for example, in Peru, Peru is a country that the main three activities since the Incas were mining, fishing, and agriculture, and still are. And in this case, the economic boom came mostly affecting the, the mining business that creates a lot of capital influx into a country. But what happened this time that is different is that agriculture at the same time develop. And now that we're looking at this crisis in emerging markets, because that's how I look at, you know, billions of dollars flying out of the, econo mm -hmm. the emerging economies, we see that mostly minerals and fishing are going down, but agricultural commodities are more or less stable. And just to give you a quick examples, one person was asking me how much of your GDP comes from agriculture. This is small, very small, but even though it's a small, it sustained 20% of the population. Peru, 15 years ago, uh, the poverty line was around 50%, meaning that half of the population were making less than a dollar per day. Today, we're talking about less than 25%. Why? Because the agricultural sector has developed so much that it has created three more million uh, employments. So this new generation of you know, new agriculture that is focused on the exports and represents about 20% of the country exports is been generating a lot of different activities around it. So we have towns where before were nobody and now we have a lot of commerce and industry that lived around agriculture. So this time after the economic boom has gone, we can see that there's an emerging middle class in Peru that is being you know, developed, but the question is if it's gonna sustain. And, uh, and this is quite simple. You, know, you have higher commodity prices, therefore you have budget surplus, therefore you have international reserve that goes up, then you have less risk, mm -hmm. then you have interest rates going down, then you have more capital expenditure, they, there you have more employment. Now that we're going in the opposite direction, and the government is talking about you know, increasing the minimum wages, everything that the government speaks of is about expending more. And I don't know if the expending more goes online with the reduce of the budget or going into deficit. Because it is not that gold has gone you know, down or all the other minerals like or oil. It's just that the middle class has increased and requires more imports. So now you have an economy that requires much more imports and your income is less by price and by throughput. So it's a very difficult uh, question to be answered. Short answer is I believe there's a difference between now and previous economic booms. Uh, we will see if the economic class survive, the medium class survive, and that is gonna be solely probably dependent on what the government does with their budgets. 
Marcos Matias, you, you cover the Andean region for, for Schneider Electric that uh, encompasses Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, now Peru and Bolivia as well. Uh, in such various sectors as uh, oil and gas utilities, construction, residential markets, food and beverages, data centers, and you know Brazil very well also. Uh, what is your view of the current outlook and what are the structural impediments to growth? I think uh, we, we are one of the entrepreneurs in, in Colombia, specifically we have more than 40 years in Colombia. So in South America, the common in our life is to have crisis. It's the only common there. So this crisis is new for us. No, this crisis is one more in our life. Because one impediment is inflation. We have inflation since more than I born. <laughs> so uh, I, I believe inflation for us is the key issue to manage a company in, in South America, the top number one. The number two is this pessimism. Uh, I, I make a comparison, for example, do, uh, I have a question for you. Um, Did you watch uh, Star Wars? Any Star Wars? Of course. <laughs> Star Wars talk about the good and the bad, mm -hmm. and the balance between the both. So look at that, the bad, Darth Vader, Lord Seed, so the dark side of the Force, is this Christ. Perhaps someone say that you are very optimistic, but in fact, the good or the force awaken in some countries that uh, I talk there's some Jedi's <laughs> in this in this a scenario very strong. And one of them is Colombia and Peru. In fact, I saw these two countries very control the situation. There is a huge impact in oil, of course, for for Colombia, from 10 billion. Uh, pesos reduce the, the, the how can I say the catch the money to four billion pe uh, pesos colombianos is a huge impact. But on the other hand, there is a lot of investments in the country. One of investments in infrastructure. I just listened that India not okay for investment in infrastructure. In Colombia, yes. Nowadays, to import a good from Europe to Cartagena in Colombia is less expensive than Cartagena to Bogota. Imagine the problem of infrastructure. So there is under construction 1,600 kilometers of roads and tunnels. It's one example, of simple example, that first of all, take out this pessimism. We have opportunities to invest. And number three, that is my concern related to the first presentation here by Dennis, is El Nino. The effect, the phenomenon El Nino could impact our agriculture business. Colombia is the second country worldwide in cafe. Brazil is number one. But this El Nino is in start to impact our production, and this is one point of exportation. So we need to take care about this situation, as he said, the act of God. We need to, to pay attention. So this, this is three factors for me at this moment I can see uh, in, in Schneider. Thank you, Marcos, and thank you for attending the whole day because you've just proven us that you were here this morning with uh, Dennis's presentation. Uh, uh, Patricia, uh, which uh, countries and markets do you see uh, the most promising and growing most rapidly in 2016? Well, uh, we are forecasting a new recession for this year, considered the, uh, the whole Latin American region to contract uh, plus 0.2 percent. But it's important to emphasize that it's really uh, impacted by the the high weight of Brazil in the GDP, around 40 percent of the the region GDP. Uh, so we see that Pacific Alliance country they are still performing better than the other ones. Yes, as Max said, uh, Colombia, Peru, uh, also Mexico, and in Chile with like 2%, they are still going, growing like 2 to 3%, 3.5 maybe for Peru in, the, in this year. Uh, but for the, for the uh, 
uh, when we say the Pacific Alliance, <coughs> sorry, uh, for countries like Brazil or for Venezuela, it's really bad. We expect in Brazil to contract by 3% this year. Yeah, it's the, the crisis should continue. And for Venezuela, it's the worst situation now because it was already to a strong crisis. This should continue as we do not expect any improvement in oil prices. Yeah. Um, Carlos Kenan, vous, vous pensez que tous les pays sont touchés de la même manière par cette euh, baisse des, des cours de matières premières Lesquels sont les plus diversifiés Lesquels sont les plus liés au commerce avec la Chine Et puis, entre les euh, grandes puissances agricoles et les grandes puissances énergétiques, qui sont parfois les mêmes, est-ce qu'il n'y a pas quand même des différences Oui, 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 il y a des différences. Je voudrais juste dire un mot sur la question de l'habitude euh, de l'Amérique latine par rapport aux crises. C'est vrai, il y a une certaine récurrence, mais après, il y a crise et crise. Mm. Et justement, peut-être ce qu'il faut retenir de la récente phase d'expansion et de prospérité, disons, qui a, qui a couvert après 2003, 2004 jusqu'en 2012, c'est que effectivement, elle a été très déficitaire sur le plan de l'utilisation de ses excédents pour le développement des infrastructures, par exemple. Disons, un bilan très, très négatif en termes de diversification productive. Pire encore, ça a été rappelé dans d'autres tables, il y a eu une appréciation des monnaies, toute une série de facteurs qui ont contribué plutôt à la décentralisation ou à une certaine reprimarisation des économies. Mais ce qui a été dans le côté positif du bilan, euh, euh, le, 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 le bon côté de la force, disons, c'est en effet... Euh, la, la, la gestion financière, pour ainsi dire, la gestion macroéconomique en termes généraux, d'autres périodes de prospérité, de bonanza, mm -hmm. euh, comme celle qu'a connue euh, l'Amérique latine récemment, se sont soldées très rapidement par des crises de paiement extérieur, crises de la dette. La plupart des pays ont euh, géré assez bien ces côtés-là des, des choses. Et du coup, les ratios d'endettement public, les ratios d'endettement extérieur, la solidité des systèmes bancaires, etc., c'est un, un aspect qui est très, très positif aujourd'hui, euh, avec des exceptions. Bien évidemment, il y a le cas du Venezuela, où il y a un cumul, n'est-ce pas, de déséquilibre important. Donc ça, c'est le premier élément. Disons que face à des situations similaires, rappelons la crise de 2009, la grande récession, états unis etc., et la bonne résilience de l'Amérique latine face à des chutes de termes de l'échange comme celles qu'on a constatées eh, l'année dernière, même mmh. ces, derniers, ces premières semaines euh, de, de, de l'année, les pays latino-américains tombaient comme des mouches par le passé. Donc là, c'est un aspect positif. Alors, quelle est la différence euh, ou la situation euh, différenciée que l'on peut effectivement euh, établir C'est que, bien évidemment... Et il y a des pays qui sont beaucoup plus dépendants euh, du pétrole et, et ils sont en grosse difficulté, disons, du fait de leur euh, déséquilibre interne. On a parlé du Venezuela. Mmh. Il y a l'Équateur qui a aussi une spécificité, c'est qu'il n'a pas de marge de manœuvre importante pour faire des politiques contre-cycliques. C'est une économie dollarisée et, et donc il subit le, le double effet, disons, de l'appréciation du dollar, perte de compétitivité et chute des prix du pétrole. Après, les économies plus diversifiées sont très variées. Et en effet, disons, le Brésil est un global trader, ça a été rappelé, mais qui est affecté par la chute des prix des matières premières parce que cela coïncide avec une crise structurelle interne. On a rappelé que les moteurs de la croissance sont cassés, qu'il y a une croissance en panne, un problème de productivité, d'infrastructure, etc. Et un mode de croissance qui est trop misé sur la demande domestique dans la phase Lula mais qui n'a euh, pas pris l'attention qu'il fallait pour ce qui est du fait que les salaires réels peuvent progresser. C'est peut-être bien pour booster la demande domestique, mais en même temps, il faut se soucier de la productivité, de la compétitivité du pays. Donc le Brésil cumule ça et avec, euh, disons, une situation très importante aussi du point de vue, ou très, très négative aussi du point de vue de la macroéconomie. Un certain nombre de, de points positifs se sont dégradés. Déficit budgétaire et croissant, par exemple. Inflation. Et, et, qui est atteint 10% cette année. Donc le Brésil, au-delà des de problèmes de, de diversification productive, est très mal en point. Ajoutons à cela une crise politique qui vient alimenter la crise économique avec la possibilité euh, de la procédure d'institution de Dilma Rousseff qui pourrait se concrétiser cette année. Alors je, je, je voudrais dire un mot et, et également euh, sur un cas et, différent qui est celui du Chili, une économie très saine du point de vue macroéconomique, mais qui, et ça montre la difficulté de la tâche, n'a pas réussi à diversifier son profit des portateurs, alors que cela, c'est dans l'agenda des pouvoirs publics depuis au moins dix ans. Pourquoi Parce que 
les prix relatifs ont été un peu contraires à cette dynamique-là. Comment voulez-vous qu'il y ait des investissements vers des secteurs, disons, liés à l'innovation, à maturité longue, etc., si c'était une très bonne affaire jusqu'en 2011-2012, exporter du cuivre, des, produits, des métaux, etc. Et tout, tout allait dans le sens du boom de ces côtés-là. Les prix relatifs étaient favorables pour investir dans ces secteurs-là. Donc, je dirais, une diversité de situations... Mais ce qui est important au-delà de ces profils d'exportation, c'est les conditions internes, disons. Là, on peut distinguer, si vous voulez, des pays qui ont plutôt bien géré la macroéconomie et qui, malgré les difficultés, disons, vont s'en se, 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 sortir avec un ralentissement important, et d'autres qui, par une, un cumul de circonstances, sont en difficulté parce qu'il peut y avoir des crises macroéconomiques graves. Mais, même dans ces cas, peut-être les seuls, le seul cas où on pourrait avoir une crise du passé en termes de crise de la dette extérieure est, à mon avis, le Venezuela. Um, José Antonio, how will the uh, U.S. interest rate hike uh, affect the uh, uh, Latin American countries and companies to pay off their dollar-denominated debt? That's a very hard question. Uh, as I said, uh, we went through you know, 10 years of almost cash-free uh, party that we were investing in different areas. In Latin America in general, some countries, they focus the investment on industry, agriculture, and, and other construction. Uh, and the question is, if these business projects are going to be able to pay off for that indebtedness that is being created. Um, what I see in general is that there are a lot of companies right now in Latin America that are not only suffering because the main, uh, the top line, the revenue is being affected because of lower commodity prices, but also the debt structure is being more heavier because the interest rates went up and it's more difficult to get capital uh, than before. So there are companies right now that they're even thinking about default or not paying debt. So definitely we're in a situation that is a little bit complicated. Now, there's one particular sector that has no show yet uh, weakness or severely decline, and that's construction. Uh, we know that real estate in general was one of the main causes for the economic downturn in 2008. It's, it, this abundance of cash going into the U.S. as the central bank just put into, you know, mortgages and created, you know, a bubble. Uh, that same effect happened already in Europe. And maybe this is time for Latin America. So this amount of cash that flew all around the world went to Latin America. And, and you have examples like, for example, in, in the middle of Lima or Buenos Aires, you, can, you could find, or Santiago Chile, property that was, you know, B some B is more expensive than in Paris or London on the same square meter on, on a comparable location. Is that sustainable? I don't think so. So we, we may see, you know, a downturn in real estate in Latin America that could severely impact and affect the capacity of the economies to recover. Uh, interest rate going up outside of Latin America, that basically means more money flowing out of a region that mm -hmm. now, nowadays is showing more um, risk and trading the risk to another economies like the US or Europe that show a little bit lower risk with a higher interest rate. Now, what is going to happen after all this money flows out of China or Latin America and goes back to the US or Europe? Mm -hmm. We don't know. We're looking at, you know, a repeat on what just happened 10 years ago. So it's, it's, it's very interesting what is going on in general with the currency exchange and the, the, the overflow of cash going around the world. But one thing I, I just want to mention that is not related to the question, but I think in the mm -hmm. long term will, it will be. If we, if we think about our planet, the globe, we will see that 
about 90% of the population live north of the equator, and 10% of the populations live south of the equator. And we also see that most resources, especially water, is contained south of the equator. We have seen in the last years that despite this downturn on prices on commodities, food prices, especially fruits, vegetables, they're stable, even going higher. As the person that was sit here, sitting here previously from the India, we see that even though China is going down, prices for agricultural commodities in China are stable or even going higher. Why is that? Because the middle class in general in the emerging countries has grown tremendously. 1900s, we were about two billion people. Life expectancy was in around the 40s. Mm -hmm. We're looking at nine billion people in a few years from now, before 2050. We're looking at life expectancy that is gonna be reaching the 80 years old. So this is a different world. And in this context, really, who owns the land and the water wins because there's no way to su supply food for nine billion people in the conditions that we are. In the, in the more developing margins like China, for example, we have seen an incredible amount of migration from the farms into the cities. Therefore, there's one less farmer, one more consumer. And this has been happening all around the emerging markets. So in general, for Latin America, on the long term, I think we have a good prospectus. Or prospectus. In the short term, we have a challenge. Marcus, uh, Matthias. Uh, so what, just one thing. You're, you're, what you're saying basically is that uh, Latin America has a competitive edge when it comes to the most important uh, uh, one of the most important products to be traded in the coming years due to the trend in the global population. Is that, is that correct? Yes, exactly. I mean, uh, food represents a very small percentage mm. of our consumption basket. But as we move forward, that percentage is going to increase. And it's going to increase and it's going to make a difference in uh, some economies. Marcus Matias, one thing that uh, Jose uh, Antonio mentioned also is the uh, risk of a property bust with the capital outflows from Latin America with interest, rate, uh, interest rates rising elsewhere in the world. Uh, is that a trend that you can uh, see as well or, or that you, uh, you're concerned about? Yes, yes, I am concerned about, but uh, it's really affect uh, us, affect all the investment in, in the region. But there is one point that the government in Colombia specific is working because nobody knows Colombia or Peru, nobody knows these countries very well. It's inexplored yet, unexplored. Colombia, if get, and is in the process, sign the peace treatment between Colombia government and FARC, the increase the GDP expectation is one, one point. One percent more only if there is, because we attract more international companies. And day by day, I can see the hub of the international companies is in Bogota or in Medellin, in Colombia, day by day. Due to the fact that Venezuela, unfortunately, is decreasing, and move to Colombia uh, perception. And the other hand is the north of uh, South America. Colombia is in a good position, geographic position, and nowadays has a huge hub for uh, airplanes or airport to move for anywhere. So answer directly, yes, there is an impact, but I think we can, day by day, can revert this situation attracting more uh, international companies to the country. Do you see opportunities in specific sectors for growth in the, next, in the coming years? Yes, absolutely. Energy is one of the mm. key... Uh, because day by day, the consumption is increasing. This is another factor important to see. Because in Colombia, the, there is an improvement in consumption on energy, and there is an interconnection to do in the country on transmission and distribution. 
So Schneider is so present on this, this factor. The another point is we are passing the fourth generation. The name is Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. And this is promote uh, data centers, perhaps not the big data centers as we can see in the United States, but the medium and small size data centers is one of uh, the investment I, I, I can see. Food and beverage, there is a huge investment on productivity. Uh, the industrial side, due to the currency, uh, devaluation, we are more competitive. And you need to invest on uh, efficiency. And uh, this is part of our story in Schneider, because we are global specialists in energy management and automation. So we connect, uh, we connect technologies to, uh, how can I say, to transform industry to transform cities and enrich the lives. That is our, our DNA to work in this segment market. Increase, to increase productivity in the agribusiness, it's not that easy. Uh, uh, and I, we talked about it, Jose Antonio, as we prepared for this panel discussion. You told me it's actually not uh, the most straightforward way to uh, uh, increase the revenue and the value in the agribusiness. It's quite difficult, and it requires a lot of capital. Mm -hmm. uh, in Peru, we have divided the modern agriculture mm -hmm. from the traditional agriculture. The modern agriculture grows at 20% per year in the last 10 years, while the traditional agriculture grows about 4 to 5% per year. And this is just because productivity is there, and not only productivity, it's better product product that can transit all the way to China, all the way to Europe, product that is being attracted by the market in a different way. So instead of producing, you know, rice or cotton, we focus on producing avocados and blueberries. Mm -hmm. And those different commodities have two different business cases. So the opportunity to increase productivity is there. It just requires a lot of capital. And in this current situation, short term, El Nino, higher risk, capital flowing into higher interest rate mm -hmm. markets with lower risk, is kind of difficult. Midterm, once we realize that food is very important, it is a long-term investment that you perhaps will consider to have in your portfolio as an investor, once Wall Street understands agriculture, probably mm -hmm. the increases of productivity are going to happen much easier. But I, sorry, I saw one effect in, the, in this, as you said, the uh, high performance food and beverage companies or actual companies. Uh, due to the fact that the dollar is not in, 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 the, in the valuation, the companies not invest in the line productions, not invest in case of Colombia. And I saw this because when I arrived there four years ago, I said, food and beverage is the market to invest. Let's put one, one guy and sales guy in this to follow all the projects. In fact, not. The importation is coming high during this phase. Now, I saw that there is a lot of movement on this direction because the importation is 40% more expensive now. And uh, the companies has money. Local companies, uh, big companies uh, like uh, Nutreza, like companies, local companies in Colombia, uh, Alpina, has good money to invest because exactly you said that they, how can I say, they catch the money, not invest so much, import the product, and now can make this balance between the investment and the new line productions. It's my perception, uh, no, not the specialist in agriculture, but uh, I saw this. Um, now there's another risk, and I think you uh, touched upon that when you talked about the... Um, no, I, it was Marcos uh, uh, when you talked about the uh, um, peace process between the uh, Colombian government and the FARC, and this is a political risk. Uh, this is pretty clear right now in, uh, in Brazil, uh, as we speak about the uh, impeachment procedure against President Dilma Rousseff. Uh, do you think it's going to go through? How likely is it that it is going to go through? And uh, what would be the repercussions, if so, on the Brazilian economy and on neighboring countries? Uh, well, uh, this crisis actually started during her first mandate. Yes, they created many economic imbalance. 
just to, to, to show some of them, one of the was energy tariffs. Uh, they decided to, to reduce energy tariffs in the, in the beginning of 2013, at uh, the time that the cost was going up uh, because the power matrix in Brazil is basically formed by hydroelectrics. And then when we have in problems of droughts, low reservoir, the reservoirs at low levels, they turn on the thermal plant. But the, the, there the cost is higher because they need to import natural gas. At that time, they decided to reduce this cost. They were this, uh, actually with the thermal plant all on. So it was insane to do this. And so and they didn't uh, confess that this was wrong. So the, the, the energy companies, uh, power companies, they got leverage during this timing, as the government didn't allow it to increase again. This was one of the cases. Another is about oil prices. Uh, before this big slump in oil prices, uh, they were selling the, the gasoline, the oil price, if the lower, uh, lower price, then they were importing yeah, from the other countries. So uh, they needed to adjust oil prices, but it didn't let to adjust the prices because this goes, go, was going to increase inflation and they were close to elections. So they, they let, uh, it was another problem for Petrobras because they didn't let the company to, to, to be efficient, yes. Uh, and then other cases, they started to expand a lot, uh, lack of discipline, fiscal discipline. So we have seen that uh, the government has, since 1994-99, they have established uh, subprime targets for each year. And they, f they first started to decrease this target for each year, and they also created uh, creative accountability to get to this figure. Yes, so when they were in the campaign last, uh, in 2014, they said that inflation was controlled. It was really close to the top of the target ceiling of 6.5. It was like 6.4. And that uh, they were, deflation interest rate was okay. And that they will continue with social welfare programs, increasing this. So they gain elections uh, of the lowest margin in the, the democracy history. Uh, but then one, one week after, central banks started to increase rates again, interest rates, because inflation was artificially low. The government uh, let then finally the energy uh, prices to increase again. Yes, and uh, so that's why, it was, that's why we see inflation going really fast uh, really going up really fast last year. Uh, it ended in 10.7% last year, and basically uh, energy prices went up 50% in one year. So for the industry that was already suffering, it was like a nightmare. How come that uh, important uh, cost, yeah, like energy, increased 50% in one year? So we started to see uh, the results of this model, yeah. And uh, they, they also, when they, they got to power, they said they would uh, improve the fiscal side. They put a pro business guy as a finance minister, that was uh, Joaquin Levy, and they set uh, a new target for surplus, but they, he, he was not able to do his work and decided to, to, to leave the government. Uh, so we have seen that this year, we are going to get to a deficit, yeah, that's the year got to the deficit, a big chance of getting to deficit this year. And as his uh, budget, the account for 2014 was not uh, approved, this has, was the main reason for, to open this uh, impeachment process. Yes, uh, so this, uh, we had a recession in, uh, from, uh, through the recession in the Congress through, during this time, Christmas and New Year's and so on. They will restart in February, so they will vote for this in Congress, uh, lower house, and or if needed, in Senate. But I don't think that this go further, that we're going to have an impeachment. Yeah, she, she should win this and she'll pass through this, this case. But actually we need to solve this very quickly because we have big economic issues to solve and they were kept, as, uh, they were set aside because the, this economic environment is, uh, political environment has, is, is more important right now. Yeah. Carlos Kenan, le Brésil perd simplement du temps avec cette procédure ou est-ce qu'il y a des problèmes plus graves aussi qui se posent euh, et où on voit se matérialiser un trait à la crise politique mais un problème de gestion qui, qui, qui traîne déjà depuis assez longtemps Disons que cette euh, évolution politique récente 
et finalement euh, révèle des, 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 des vieux problèmes de, de la gestion politique du Brésil. Depuis longtemps, on parle d'une réforme politique, justement, mm. les modes d'élection de, de, des députés, et la façon de fonctionner, justement, le tout dans un pays qui est un pays très fédéral, où le pouvoir politique est très fragmenté. Je rappelle pour mémoire juste que la dictature militaire des années 60 a dû mettre en place un parlement pour gérer, même mm. si c'était un pouvoir militaire, et cette diversité des situations régionales. Et du coup... Et ça se traduit aussi par la difficulté des gestions politiques du fait que la fragmentation est aussi en termes de partis politiques. Mmh. Jusqu'à une date récente, jusqu'aux années 90, avec l'émergence et la consolidation du PSDB, de l'ancien président Cardoso, du, du candidat Aécio Neves, qui est perdu de très peu, comme, comme tu disais, face à Dilma Rousseff lors de la dernière élection, jusqu'à l'émergence du PSDB, puis l'émergence du PT, du parti de Lula, il n'y avait pas pratiquement de partis nationaux au Brésil. C'était des partis régionaux avec des caudillos. Donc ça révèle effectivement un problème de gestion politique du pays euh, qui pousse à la corruption pour trouver mmh. des accords. Et euh, malheureusement, hum, ce n'est pas sûr que par la procédure pas, de l'institution éventuelle de Dilma Rousseff, mmh. on arrive à résoudre ces problèmes. Mais il est clair que ça ne peut pas durer éternellement. Non plus, c'est un passe politique. Et qu'il euh, faudrait que d'une manière ou d'une autre... Et 2016 soit l'année des, 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 des qualifications dans ce mmh. domaine-là. Si euh, Dilma Rousseff arrive à passer les caps, bien évidemment, euh, ça va impliquer quand même une deuxième partie du mandat, disons, assez difficile, assez faible, malgré tout. Et si, euh, effectivement, il y a un processus d'institution qui, qui aboutit, euh, ce n'est pas pour autant que la situation va se stabiliser. Il faudrait mmh. voir, justement, le, le vice-président aussi est entaché, disons, ou est accusé des problèmes de corruption. Donc, euh, C'est une année assez, assez tendue qui va caractériser le Brésil sur le plan politique. Il y a aussi les Jeux Olympiques, justement, pour euh, donner une autre dimension aussi à l'actualité du Brésil, qui va être un élément important. Mais euh, euh, le Brésil a besoin de, 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 de résoudre ça, de surmonter ça, pour s'attaquer aux problèmes structurels euh, des fonds. Autre euh, pays, ah oui. Just a comment. I think that another important point there is because they are already have the Labour Party has already been in the government for over 12 years. So I think it's important to have uh, rotation, government uh, parties rotations, because when you are already more than 12 years, it's easy to, 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 to corruption to get stronger. You get a big network, corruption network. Yes. Peut-être un élément important aussi, oui. l'évolution du Brésil est très importante pour l'ensemble de l'Amérique du Sud. On néglige mm. parfois un peu le fait que d'autres pays de la région commercent beaucoup avec le Brésil. C'est un partenaire important pour la Colombie, pour le Pérou, pour l'Argentine, par exemple, c'est le principal. Oui. Donc, c'est un élément important pour débloquer la situation générale de l'Amérique du Sud, même si le contexte international des matières premières etc., est difficile, que la situation brésilienne évolue. Autre pays en crise, Carlos Kenan, c'est le Venezuela actuellement. Euh, comment se présente la cohabitation Est-ce que pour vous, le, le pouvoir euh, du président Nicolas Maduro est menacé euh, Quelles sont les réactions possibles Et, et notamment l'impact sur l'industrie pétrolière nationale et l'économie du pays. On sait que c'est un pays qui a pu réagir dans le passé par des mesures assez drastiques de nationalisation, par exemple, hein, quand le pouvoir se sentait menacé. Disons, la cohabitation s'annonce très difficile. Mm parce que c'est un pays très polarisé, euh, donc vous avez un pouvoir législatif qui est maintenant contrôlé par l'opposition, même s'il y a une, un débat sur trois députés dont la, la légitimité de l'élection se, se, se pose. C'est crucial, parce que ça peut permettre de réformer la Constitution. Voilà, parce qu'avec ces, ces trois députés supplémentaires, ouais. l'opposition peut avoir la majorité qualifiée, lui permettant de euh, modifier la constitution et de, 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 de contrer un nombre d'actions du gouvernement, du pouvoir exécutif. Et, mais en face de cela, il y a le pouvoir exécutif, justement, le pouvoir judiciaire également, et, et même euh, l'armée. C'est un élément très important qui est, à, disons, proche de, de, de ou, ou, ou acquise plutôt à, aux orientations du président Maduro. Alors, il est en danger, il est en difficulté, le président Maduro, oui, parce que, justement, euh, l'opposition peut déclencher au cours de l'année 2016 les procédures des, des référendums dits révocatoires pour justement voir à ce moment-là du mandat présidentiel s'il continue ou pas. Ça a été déjà utilisé, ces mécanismes de référendum révocatoire établis dans la Constitution réformée par l'ancien président Chavez ou euh, proposé et approuvé par l'ancien président Chavez au, au début des années 2000. C'était en 2004, mais à ce moment-là, 
ça a échoué, c'est-à-dire que les comptes de la contestation politique face au gouvernement du président Chavez à ce moment-là étaient fortes, mais lui, il avait réussi à renverser la situation et la hausse du prix, du prix du pétrole aidant, il a réussi à, 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 à s'en sortir. Or, maintenant, les prix du pétrole ne vont pas aider, donc la, la situation est véritablement euh, euh, difficile. Qu'est-ce qui peut se passer, disons Ce n'est pas facile à, à, à faire. Bien malin, celui qui arrivera à, à nous dire ce qui va se passer exactement au Venezuela en, en 2016, mais euh, il, est, il semble peu probable que le, 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 ce qui serait raisonnable se produise, c'est-à-dire que les secteurs les plus modérés des deux camps se mettent d'accord pour mettre en place un programme qui euh, avait été esquissé en, 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 à la mi-2014 par l'ancien ministre de, du pétrole Rafael Ramirez qui était l'idée de bon, euh, en, en finir progressivement avec les subventions du prix de l'essence qui est un élément très important du déficit budgétaire euh, corriger la situation de plusieurs types d'échanges et aller vers une, un taux d'échange unique mmh. progressivement et euh, euh, concentrer à ce moment-là les réserves d'échange qui étaient aussi éparpillées dans différents fonds et dans une gestion très opaque. Malheureusement, euh, on voit plutôt se profiler un scénario de persistance de la polarisation politique et, et encore une fois, une situation très difficile à prévoir à très court terme. Uh, with the opposition in Venezuela winning a majority in parliament, with Maurizio Macri being elected uh, 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 president in Argentina, do you see uh, this trend uh, that uh, occurred in the uh, early 2000s, this sort of leftist trend across uh, uh, Latin America now reversing? Uh, how far is it going to go? Thinking of uh, an election that uh, will be held next year in Ecuador, for instance, a country that both of you are probably very interest, uh, interested in. And also, uh, there's another election coming in April in Peru. Maybe first, uh, Marcos, uh, can you answer this? I just take the Peru, so yes. <laughs> I saw that there is a, uh, in my opinion, uh, South America is a little bit, or Latin America is a little bit polarized and sometimes go to the left and now it seems that we move to, to the right, uh, left side of the, the darkness or, <laughs> or right side of the darkness. I don't know what exactly is the good or bad in this case, but in fact, uh, 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 we need to have a movement. It's clear for South America. We can't stay in the same uh, economic situation. We need to change. I don't know from Peru if you have more, more opinion because in the case of Colombia, we just change. In Ecuador, Ecuador that's there because will be an Rafael, Rafael just decided not take part yes. anymore. So, so Rafael Correa will not run for a second term. Yes. Yeah, so this is a, a this is really really key decision for Ecuador. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see the, the candidates. There is no one strong candidate, and I didn't see. And, and this is a point of concern for next year. And there's a strong candidate in Peru that is uh, uh, Keiko Fujimori. She's the daughter of uh, uh, former president uh, Alberto Fujimori. Uh, uh, Jose Antonio, how, how, I mean, the outcome, the election is coming now in, in, in April. It's just uh, three months from now. What do you see? How do you see things uh, going there? Well, going to the election per se, it's she's a clear runner-up. She mm -hmm. has more than 35% support. In Peru, we have an election that has two phases. You know, if you win by 50% or more, you go directly into government. If you win the election for less than 50%, you go into a second round. And the question perhaps is, who is going to run with her in the second round? Because what we have perceived in Peru in the last two elections is that the president gets elected basically by the people that vote against Fujimori. So anybody that will run with Keiko will have a very good chance of being elected just because there is a huge faction that is against Fujimori. Same as Fujimori has a very solid 30% approval that has been there for the last, I will say, 15 years. There is another faction that is around 30% too that they won't ever vote for Fujimori or a Fujimori person. 
So this is going to be very interesting. Now, these political questions are, are, are also very interesting because it will allow me to just briefly mm -hmm. uh, go into one theory. In Latin America, we tend to put too much expectation in who is going to be the president. And we tend to really not press attention of how much the institutions are really the pillar of our economies and our nations. And this waiting for the next Superman, it's something that needs to stop. And, and, and one clear example of what is the role of the president is being what is, has happened in the last 10 years. Here we have two theories. Either we have all Latin America, but three or four countries that were all aligned and rowing in the same direction and very all well connected, except for these three or four guys, or there were other factors that were perhaps more important mm. than the presidents itself. Uh, of course, China is a direct you know, uh, pool that brought these countries out, out of the you know, poverty. Mm -hmm. But there are few countries that have decided to invest money in creating institutions that are more solid, more professional, and perhaps those countries are the ones that have the better chances to overcome and become you know, a developed society. And uh, Peru, I think, is one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen so many uh, different changes on the top, but at the end, the, the economic policy mm -hmm. that has been set in the 90s mm -hmm. continue to be the same, you know, more than 20 years past. Carlos, just a last word of conclusion, it will have to stop there. Just a word on the aspect of institution, which seems very important. And let's say that Parmi les institutions, il y a une grande diversité de, de, de cas. Il y a les institutions de gestion macroéconomique, par exemple, très solides au Pérou, mais euh, il y a les institutions démocratiques, plus généralement. Et c'est cela qui est peut-être intéressant à soulever. Malgré les difficultés et les problèmes, il y a une, une coexistence de deux de, de, de phénomènes en Amérique latine en ce moment. D'une part, comme cela a été rappelé par Julien, Lorsque les difficultés économiques se développent, et une, il y a une tendance à, à, la, à, à, à que se, se développe aussi le risque politique, parce que mmh. eh, bon, euh, une certaine, euh, un certain mécontentement peut se mmh. développer, des formes de contestation, etc. Mais en même temps, et c'est l'intéressant de l'Amérique latine, les institutions démocratiques ont fonctionné et fonctionnent ces dernières périodes. C'est-à-dire qu'il y a de l'alternance. Mmh. Il y a eu euh, un gouvernement plutôt de, avec une orientation plus dirigiste, mmh. euh, mettant beaucoup l'accent sur le rôle de l'État dans la gestion globale, etc. En Argentine, le kirchnerisme, maintenant, il y a une orientation plus libérale. Euh, dans un pays qui n'est pas facile, parce que et une caractéristique fondamentale de l'Argentine, par exemple, mmh. c'est la difficulté à établir des compromis socio-institutionnels stables. Mmh. On va dans, dans nos dans mmh. sens dans l'autre. Mais ceci peut effectivement être une autre caractéristique de cette période, au-delà des de, de vagues de gauche ou de droite, c'est-à-dire dans les difficultés, les gens choisissent l'alternance, choisissent une autre voie. Et c'est cela qui me semble un message important et positif. Dans d'autres périodes, les choses étaient résolues de manière virulente, disons. Et là, c'est un continent de paix, même s'il y a un gros problème que nous n'avons pas évoqué, qui est important du point de vue du risque qu'est le narcotrafic. Et c'est un impact surtout en Amérique centrale. Donc, je dirais que, pour contrer un petit peu cette vision, un petit peu parfois négative, certes, mm. à court terme, ça a été évoqué, il y a des grosses difficultés. À moyen terme, disons, mm. peut-être des opportunités se développent, entre autres du mm. fait de la dépréciation de, 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 du change, c'est une opportunité pour la diversification productive. Mais, d'une manière générale, les institutions démocratiques fonctionnent. Merci beaucoup, Carlos Cavan, dans Restera là. Je remercie nos panélistes d'avoir accepté de débattre, euh, non pas en espagnol ni en portugais, mais d'avoir accepté une langue médiane, soit le français, soit l'anglais. Euh, merci à tous d'avoir suivi euh, cette journée de débat. Juste un dernier mot pour vous dire, pour le, le guide euh, des risques là, que vous avez donc dans vos sacs, vous avez également une version en anglais qui est disponible à l'accueil. Je vais vous, demande de, vous demander aussi de bien vouloir remettre les casques de traduction qui vous ont été remis à l'entrée, là où vous les avez euh, obtenus, c'est-à-dire à, à l'entrée de cette même salle. Il ne me reste plus qu'à vous souhaiter une très bonne année 2016 et à vous donner rendez-vous en 2017 pour le colloque face risque pays. Merci. Merci.